A warm welcome to all who are joining us uh, this evening for our keynote presentation, Making a New Reality. We hope that you are all enjoying the conference so far. We are one week into this virtual conference and we thank all who have actively engaged in the various workshops, presentations, and other learning opportunities in this last week. At this point, we have over 3,000 participants from all over the world. And if you've missed any of the presentations over the course of this week, um, not to worry. Please know that you can access recordings of the presentations on our conference app through the end of August. And after that, with the permission of the presenters, the recording will be available on our Association for Baha'i Studies Vimeo site as well. We are so thrilled to welcome you this evening to this keynote presentation by Kamal Sinclair. Uh, before I introduce Kamal, um, we would like to start with a devotional presentation that has been created by Elizabeth D'Souza, who is an artist and educator. We're very grateful to Elizabeth for putting this together. We'll start with this devotional.
kindle the fire of love and burn away all things then set thy foot into the land of the Wow, thank you again to our very creative brother-sister duo, Liz de Souza and Jesse Washington for that beautiful devotional presentation. So creative, so moving. Thank you very much. What a wonderful start to this keynote this evening. Um, for those of you who might be joining us just now, welcome again. Uh, we hope that this week has been engaging. We want to thank all our presenters and participants for such an insightful um, several days. And we very much look forward to the rest of the week as well. At this point, we have about 3,000 participants from all over the world. And so wherever you are, morning, afternoon, evening, we hope that you are well, staying safe, and having a wonderfully enriching experience at this year's ABS conference. I'd also like to draw your attention week to a session on Wednesday, August 5th, especially if you'd like to learn a little more about recent developments in the work of the Association for Baha'i Studies as well as unfolding plans and efforts to strengthen the community's capacity to contribute to the discourses of society within the broader context of the five-year plan. I am now thrilled to introduce our keynote presenter for this evening, morning, afternoon, depending on where you are, Kamal Sinclair. Kamal is the executive director of the Guild of Future Architects and senior consultant to Sundance Institute's Future of Culture Initiative. She also serves as external advisor to MacArthur Foundation's journalism and media program. She's the creative advisor to Four Freedoms, MIT's center for Advanced Virtuality, Starfish, Incubator, and iBeam. No lack of experience and expertise here. Previously, she was the director of Sundance Institute's New Frontier Labs program, 
which supports artists working at the convergence of film, art, media, and technology. She also consults for the Ford Foundation's Just Films program on a research project aimed at furthering equality in emerging media, which resulted in making a new reality. So at this conference this, conference this year, as we think about constructive engagement, Kamal encourages us to think about the role of narratives in imagining our futures. The macro narratives created by our many individual stories become powerful organizing forces to coordinate change. What stories are we telling ourselves about the future? Who is authoring these stories? How will they impact the reality we make? These are the questions that Kamal has grappled with and will be sharing some of her insights. So Kamal Sinclair presents key findings from her Ford Foundation commissioned research on furthering equality in emerging media, making a new reality that helped launch a global community of practice working to democratize the imagination of our future. She shares insights on the high stakes of limiting inclusion in the design process of future systems, offers frameworks for leveraging the best practices of co-creation, and discusses how speculative imagination can help unlock human potential to establish an abundance of well-being. And aside from all of this, of course, if you know Kamal, you also know that the joy and purpose with which she lives her life is infectious and has affected many of us in the most positive and inspiring way. Please help me in welcoming our keynote for the evening, Kamal Sinclair. Thank you so much, Shabnam. I am deeply, deeply humbled by that kind and generous introduction. Um, and a little bit blushing because uh, obviously we're all working and striving every day to try to make an impact on the world. And so I appreciate ABS for inviting me to present to this incredible community of 3000 people globally that are deeply engaged in the discourse of how are we going to establish um, systems that center the ideals of oneness of humanity. And so it's just such a th thrill and a humbling experience to be able to be here with you all this evening, afternoon and morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, as Shabnam so kindly shared, I have had an incredible opportunity to be in a community, a global community um, at the intersection of art, science and technology over the last 12 years total um, through various different organizations. Um, and it has um, resulted in not only this research that I'm going to share today, Making a New Reality, which was, you know, the result of um, uh, reviewing a thousand articles and um, interviewing um, 30 plus people uh, through a formal uh, research project. And then um, after that formal project ended, doing being able to present and share this research globally for the last four years, um, the discourse has continued and I've, I've hopefully been updating this uh, deck so that it feels very fresh. Um, um, I, before we get into the presentation, I just wanna start by acknowledging that I am coming to you from Los Angeles um, and that is land that it traditionally um, is the land of the Tongva people and the Chumash people and other indigenous peoples that have lived here for thousands of years and been the stewards of this land. And so I just wanna acknowledge that I am on that land that has been stewarded by the Tongva and the Chumash. Um, and now we can get into it. Um, I'm gonna be dropping a lot of information on you very quickly, I have a lot of slides. Luckily this is recorded so we can go back. <laughs> later. Um, also, there is a makingnewreality.org, which has some of the articles that, that talks about this, but there also will be a, a book being published for early 2021 for academic environments and for culture institutions. So um, a lot of different ways to, to access this information. But I just wanted to start out by talking about 
the fact that we are in a time of disruption. And this disruption, as we all know, is natural in terms of climate and in terms of the natural world. It's in terms of social, um, ideological conflicts that are, are kind of opening, uh, expressing um, very, very old pandemics uh, around race and inequity. And we're also in a time of incredible disruption around technology. Um, and this isn't just a traditional pattern of like cycles of booms and busts, winners and losers, um, adopters and Luddites that may be frustrating at time, but is rooted in an optimistic narrative of progress, growth and development, the kind of Silicon Valley narrative. We are in a much more fundamental disruption that is playing out in our politics, our, our sciences, our, and our culture. And so I want to just kind of preference that that is the environment with which this research emerges out of. And just kind of bringing in the Baha'i lens on this, I just wanted to share two quotes um, that I hope that you can uh, kind of hold into your um, framework as we continue to go through this presentation. Um, the power of the rational soul can discover the realities of things, comprehend the peculiarities of beings, and penetrate the mysteries of existence. All sciences, knowledge, arts, wonders, institutions, discoveries, and enterprises come from the exercised intelligence of the rational soul. There was a time when they were unknown, preserved mysteries and hidden secrets. The rational soul gradually discovered them and brought them out of the plane of the invisible and the hidden into the realm of the visible. Abdul Baha some answered questions. I also want to share that by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through his soul, man, is able to perceive the divine reality of things. All great works of art and science are witness to this power of the spirit, Abdu'l-Bahá Paris Talks. So just think about that relationship of, you know, us as human beings and our rational faculties and our soul and the fact that the arts and the sciences are the means with which we access um, and penetrate these hidden mysteries and bring them into the plane of the visible. Because um, this is a phenomenal thing that I have had such an exciting opportunity to witness um, in a community at the intersection of art and science uh, that I'm hoping to share just a glimpse of with you today. So I wanted to just start by telling you a little bit about my relationship to story and storytellers. Um, as Shabnam shared, I worked at the Sundance Institute for um, this is the institute that runs the film festival. It's a 40 year old institution that has been really at the, at the forefront of independent filmmaking. Um, Robert Redford started it in the 1980s. And um, I had the, the joy and the pleasure of being mentored by um, Michelle Satter, who was the number two employee at Sundance and helped in such a quiet and humble and just incredible way um, of ushering in independent voices to be able to talk about um, what, what was happening in the world in ways that tried to diversify the voices, tried to expose where there was injustice in the world, and really tried to, to generate a discourse around it. And on my first, I mean, this is an intimidating place to, to work for when you first um, come on, because this is a woman that launched, you know, incredible careers like Ryan Coogler and Ava DuVernay and all of these people that have been at the forefront of of trying to, you know, kind of impact the masses with storytelling. Um, and the first thing she told me um, <laughs> on my first one-on-one -on -one meeting with her was, your job is to find artists that make meaning. And for probably about three years, I thought I understood what that meant. Um, I would you say, oh yeah, we're trying to find artists that are doing meaningful work. They are, you know, looking at things like, you know, refugee crisis or climate change or racial injustice. And they're trying to, you know, kind of just expose all of these things that are in the world through narrative or through fiction. I mean, through narrative and fiction or through documentary and nonfiction. Um, but it wasn't until about three years in that I was sitting in a matinee watching a, a film by myself of a cancer battle. Um, and in this afternoon, my mother had gone through two cancer battles by this point. Um, and in the, I don't know if any of you've had this experience, but when you're in, in a caretaking position with a loved one who's going through something that is you know, possibly 
um, could take them from this world and this plane of existence. You know, I, it, for, interestingly for me, a lot of it was very pedestrian. It was like, oh, can I get you some coffee? Do you need your medicine? Do you want, you know, a glass of water? You know, it was just very much like in this kind of pedestrian everyday, almost like small talk. And the weight of the, and this is years after she had um, gone into remission after her second breast cancer battle, that I realized uh, sitting in this movie that the kind of weight of my relationship with my mother and all the meaning of what it meant to be the child of a person, to have two souls having this relationship and to having um, the, the, the kind of reality of each of our you know, souls, both in this world and the world to come, the mortality or the immortality of it, all of that that was hidden in these small gestures of, you know, of small talk and, and small pedestrian gestures of care kind of fell into my body and I could not stop weeping. So interestingly, it was watching this film after my experience that helped me to fully contextualize the deep meaning of that experience with my mother and my relationship with her. So when, so when I, I, it was then that I understood what Michelle had meant. She said, we are looking for artists that make meaning by giving us the moment, the, the aesthetic experiences to contextualize what is deeply known, but is not always visible, that is sometimes very much hidden. And so that, I just wanted to share that so that you have that context because, you know, how do artists express or create situations for people to access or to experience that meaning making. They do it through a communication architecture. They do it through media, through a medium. Um, and this story that I'm telling you today is very much about the human communication architecture um, and how we, what tools we use and, and what are the ethics around those tools and to create that kind of spiritual and transcendent and, and transformative exchange. Um, so, we're, we have always had a communication architecture since the beginning of, you know, whether it be body language, oral storytelling, pictorial images on cave walls, we've always had some way in which an idea and emotion has translated from one person to another or a group of people translating together. And about 500 years ago, we created a fundamental disruption to many thousands of years of the way that we were communicating when we began creating and adopting these tools of mass media, printed text, radio, you know, recorded sound, film, television. And these exponential advancements allowed us to break from the limitations of time and space and expand our sense of reality. You know, people had profound experiences like actually, you know, having a Bible in their home which was something that was just, you know, a very rare thing before the printing press. They were able to read these things with their own eyes and have a different relationship of interpretation and, and access to that knowledge. They had um, things like, uh, to the other extreme, seeing Earth from space and having this image of the globe go around the world and, it, and completely shift. I mean, it really changed us to be able to have this expression of a communication of something that was capturing some aspect of our reality and sharing it on a mass level that shifted our sense of even what it means to be um, on this planet. It, it shifted us into thoughts of the, the kind of um, maybe arbitrariness of our boundaries between our social context like nations and states. And this, so, so you know, the artist and the philosophers, they responded in trying to do that meaning making work. They culturally responded with postmodernism and surrealism, existentialism, you know, all of these things, Afrofuturism, all of these things that we're working to try to understand now that, that now that we see the earth as this big green and blue ball, how do we contextualize our meaning? And so I bring this up, this is not news to anyone here, um, but I really bring this up because we are now, 500 years later, at another major disruption in our human communication architecture. We are in the beginning of another fundamental disruption. This is not just an expansion of scope, scale, and efficiency like mass media. It is one that results in systems that can independently think, that are becoming intelligent, that can integrate with our bodies. Like before, this new vision is challenging our notions of reality. It is causing us to wrestle with binary and overly simplified narratives that the limitations of our past versions of our communication infrastructure allowed us 
to understand about ourselves and it's creating like new identity crises. Um, we are trying to navigate the most complex, abundant and dynamic communication and information system in history. But I argue that we are doing this still with things that are limiting our, perceptual, our perceptions. Um, some might call them blinders. But before I unpack that little cliffhanger, I wanted to back up and just tell you what led me to emerging media work in the first place. I started out as a live performing arts, completely analog artist, uh, dancer. I was one, one of the things I did back in the day was be a cast member of Stomp. I was a live performing arts theater maker and dancer for 27 years. And so to find myself um, here is quite, quite surreal. Um, I, so I was with Stomp for a long time, about six years. I uh, went back to school, got my, I got my undergrad in um, Tisch School of the Arts for theater. I went to get my master's degree in business. And then I was able, at the dawn of kind of social media and, and interactive media and the ways in which the internet kind of changed shape in the early, in 2005, 2006, 2007, I had the opportunity to come on as a transmedia art um, uh, artist on an art project that is now at the Smithsonian African American Museum called Question Bridge Black Males. And this was looking at interactive documentary and participatory media, um, one of the kind of projects of that time, building off of you know previous work in the field, of course. Um, and then I got the opportunity through that to, to go to New Frontier Story Lab at Sundance and, and direct that. Um, came as a fellow in 2011 and then became the director of that program in 2012. Um, and there it was amazing because I had just literally thousands, I had access and a vantage point to thousands of artists and creative technologists around the world submitting ideas to us on a regular basis. So it gave us this opportunity to see the intersection of all these things in a really high, high fidelity way. Um, and it just, it was, it was such a privilege and an honor to have that access to these incredible ideas. Um, and so I ended up from, you know, in these thought leadership spaces like the World Economic Forum in Davos, I mean, sorry, not in Davos, in Dalian, China, summer Davos um, in 2017, where I'm sitting on a panel with the president of Baidu, which is the um, largest search engine in China, you know, the CEO of um, Infosystems, large tech company in India, a Yale professor, Hong Kong University professor in AI, robotics, and artificial intelligence, and um, uh, uh, um, kind of computational science. And I'm a dancer. <laughs> I'm a theater maker. And it was quite overwhelming and quite surprising to find myself being in this space talking about the question, should we unleash artificial intelligence? And this is 400 people in the room, 4 million people looking at this online. And I'm, I'm facing these world leaders and trying to be part of the conversation. Um, I mean, this is crazy. How does a dancer go into these environments? And, it, and I had a lot of imposter syndrome as I continued to go along the, the, the route um, over these 10 years, or, or thir 12 or 13 now. And what was really interesting is I had to kind of reconcile with that and get over that and say, you know what, as an artist, I am absolutely, and especially as a woman of color, and a person from a, a religious minority group. I have so many kind of experiences that inform me, my, my lens on things that I'm absolutely the right person to be in these rooms. And I do not need to be the only person in these rooms that are coming from intersectional backgrounds that are not normally represented in these technology and economic and, and um, you know kind of thought leadership spaces. Um, and so I had to kind of gird up my loins as they say and, and um, and be willing to be in these spaces that I didn't feel uh, that I was welcomed in all the way or that I was even appropriate to be in and realize that I did have something to give. And I wanna talk about that, who has something to give into these conversations that can be sometimes quite elite, elitist. So I just wanna thank and acknowledge Ford Foundation, Sundance and Immerse, which is a um, publication on emerging technology and, and storytelling for all of their incredible support in doing this work uh, to create this research project. Um, and I also wanna just um, 
let you know that I am obviously standing on the shoulders of a huge community of people that I've been in discourse with and conversation with. The words that are coming out of my mouth are really me doing my best attempt at honoring what I've heard um, in the field. And so this is this is definitely a synthesis of an incredible community of folks and not my own thoughts. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, so what is emerging media? This is where, you know, we get, get your, <laughs> get ready for a gauntlet of information. Um, so, you know, at the time, this is back in 2016, 2017, things like virtual reality, social media, XR, were kind of surfacing to the top of when I, of the terms when I asked that question of my interviewees of, and when I did my kind of uh, scrub of the research of the, you know, kind of industry-based and scholarly articles about what emerging media was. Um, but I wanna get beyond just like these top statistics and really get into what really gets interesting is the stuff that is not even on this list because that were so few people mentioning because that is the stuff that is at the very forefront and the fringe that we really, where I, I believe we need to have the most um, uh, kind of diverse and inclusive and collective conversation in order to understand who we want to be and what kind of reality we want to make with these exponential technologies. So quickly, some of the things that people said were, you know, we are physical beings um, with obviously kind of spiritual and mental and, and other kind of faculties that relate to the physical. Um, and so some people were we're trying to, to see how does the body stay connected in a media environment that's getting ever more virtual and more screen-based. And so some artists like Lynette Walworth out of Australia, she was playing the, the power of the body and, and kind of the lizard brain and the kind of the ways in which the body helps us to understand and contextualize reality. Um, and she interviewed many women that had gone through some of the worst atrocities of the human condition, Dafur, the Holocaust, um, war and conflict. And she wrote their stories in a book and you read this in the installation. And then you walked up to a black screen with like a door frame on it and you put your hand on the blackness and through a randomized algorithm, one of those women life size would walk from far away in the darkness and walk up to you and put their hand right onto your hand. And this just, just put people into tears. Um, and this is a digital representation of this woman, but something about the idea of a hand touching a hand kind of triggered a sense of intimacy and a sense of connection to somebody that they are removed from in distance in time, but they have this deep emotional and spiritual like relationship with. Um, interactive, um, uh, interactive film where people are kind of taking the best of gaming in terms of agency and the best of cinematic fluid narrative and, and performance and finding these incredible kind of intersections. Bandersnatch and the things that you see on Netflix, branching narratives are not the best representation of this stuff. I've seen some phenomenally fluid and beautiful works um, in terms of interactive film. Um, you know, people talked about the, you know, people that have grown up on Facebook in, that are in their 20s or in their teens wanting ethereal liveness. They don't want to always be tracked and recorded and always have this, this kind of, um, they want them, uh, something that is ephemeral, is a moment that can never happen again. So things like the ways in which Snapchat was, was designing for that urge and need in a particular generation. Um, you know, escape rooms, immersive theater, um, you know, all these kinds of things, uh, live performance documentary. Um, we even supported Samanaj developing, uh, he wanted to reinvent the one man show, which became Homecoming King and Patriot Act. Um, you know, omnidirectional storytelling, where the storytelling, one of the first papers I read in Transmedia was that it did not have to be linear. And so that kind of, it's like the difference between seeing the world from just a, a vantage point of a horizon to seeing the world from space, where you have all these different directional relationships to story. We had geocache storytelling where people would, would this is early on where we were, people were geocaching a novel, chapters of a novel all over the United States. And when you went to that place and you unlocked that chapter, the story was completely designed to match the architecture and the landscape around you in such deep and immersive ways. And then people could leave their own stories and add to the novel in a participatory storytelling. We saw in things like symphonies that were mapped to landscapes where you could have 400 different parallel paths of listening to the symphony, like at the mall on Washington in Washington, D.C., where aspects of the symphony would kind of change depending on how you, you kind of navigated the landscape. And when you got to the obelisk, the entire symphony and the choir and the timpanies all came in. And so, you know, just completely changing the relationship between space and time and sound. Um, I won't go into all the details, but things like 
um, this landmark project we supported called 1979 Revolution, where someone who was a survivor of the Black Friday, um, when he saw the Arab Spring, he was just overwhelmed with how Western media didn't understand the fog of war and how when you're put in the middle, and I think we're understanding that a little bit more now that we're in this pandemic, but that you have to make survival and moral and political choices in real time without the right and full context of information and how that how they took gaming and documentary film and they combined them so they put you in the shoes of somebody who had to navigate the Black Friday in 79 in Iran. And no matter what choice you made in the video game, you had to live out the consequences of somebody who made that choice on Black Friday. And you got to see in hindsight, from their hindsight, but you were put into the current context of that moment. So you had to kind of experience and be complicit in history. So this was a this this won a BAFTA or got nominated for a BAFTA award. It just really broke records in terms of how gaming could help us to understand documentary in a whole new way. A participatory storytelling, social art practice. Um, I can go on and on and on about the ways in which collective um, practice has been evolving, the ways in which characters don't stay put on screens. This is one of our artists that did a project where the you could use a cell phone to manipulate the light in the screen. And it was quite phenomenal to see how the light would move inside of, and then at the end of it, without us knowing, our face falls into the screen while the protagonist's face falls out of it and goes into our cell phone as this cracked mirror image. And so the ways in which characters don't stay put in one platform where they can start to navigate and live in, have Hamlet live in your pocket and jump from that to other screens. It was just phenomenal how artists were changing it. And then data-based storytelling. This was huge. We had a uh, we did a residency with the social computing group at MIT where we put artists into that social computing group to play with data as clay for storytelling. And it was, I mean, this is one of the kind of seminal works that came back in 2005 about how 20, 65 million of the blogosphere could be translated into a lyrical, gorgeous data visualization of the human emotion. Um, but then now it's gone from something like this, which journalists use every day in terms of data and visual storytelling, to uh, Internet of Things, wired city, object-based, what they call ambient storytelling. So this is an Afrofuturist um, technology group in Brooklyn who created a speculative artifact from the African diasporic future, but it works, you know, it's a really functioning piece. And you can walk around New York City, and this is years ago, um, where this lantern will light up whenever it crosses a place where a black person was killed by a police officer. So there's no screen, there's no audio, but the story is so um, intrinsically rich in terms of just navigating uh, the city in which you live in. Um, other kinds of ways in which wired and smart objects start to come into the storytelling canvas, and I won't go into all the details. We had artists that were starting to play with what they call um, artificial intelligence, conversational AI, where they're using the smart devices in your home to not only listen to a story like you would a podcast, but actually be able to be in conversation with the characters through this um, smart system. And that also the story world of those characters can start to fall into your home, take over your smart objects, turn off and on your lights, start your popcorn machine, whatever it is, they are, um, part of the environment around you. And so uh, this is um, something that is really taking root, this conversational relationship with characters and story. Um, we had a piece at Sundance last year that showed all the ways in which that smart home um, tracks and, and um, analyzes who you are and what you are. Um, we had um, pieces like Breathe that analyzed how your breath from magic leap, augmented reality experience, you saw how your breath interacted with the ecosystem and over a week's time, they sent you back a data visualization of how your breath went and interacted with the ecosystem globally. Um, I won't go into all the details because I know we're, uh, you know, it's a lot of time, but virtual reality in terms of 360 film, room scale, um, this is um, six degrees of freedom, um, you know, where your whole body is at scale inside of these virtual experiences, which can be quite beautiful if you've never experienced them. And then hyper reality. This is a piece that was created by a Swiss medical researcher and technologist who was working with schizophrenic um, patients. And he thought, well, what if we give them an experience of a non-human 
out, uh, you know, kind of body experience. So he created this machine to give them a sense of flight as a, a hawk flying over cityscapes like San Francisco. Um, and this was such a phenomenal breakthrough in terms of hyper reality design, where people are definitely transcending just the normal pedestrian human experience of story and experience. It's it you really are flying like a bird. It's crazy. Um, they did the same thing with a piece that tried to give you a sense of weightlessness by putting you in a space environment in a virtual reality piece while in a swimming pool. Um, there's all kinds of incredible ways in which the fidelity and the ways in which our neurology can now be, I don't wanna say tricked, but brought into a different environment that feels so faithful to um, what we perceive with our traditional kind of, you know, five senses as reality. We even have um, real life performance and real life avatars. You know, this is a theater piece where the actor is performing all the characters in the, in the virtual space um, because his body is being tracked and it's being, he's puppeting um, these virtual avatars in real time. We even had a piece that they were able to track food. So you could eat something um, in the real world while you were, um, having this disassociation. So you might be eating cotton candy in the real world, but in the virtual world, it looked like something totally, like you're eating a cloud or you were, it's just an incredible way of all the ways in which our physical bodies are being engaged with this virtual. And then the National Theater in London did something that was a really real breakthrough, this one actor to one audience member theater piece of a, of a mother that was dying of cancer, engaging with son, it was autobiographical made by the artist. and everybody that went through this at the Tribeca Film Festival got this relationship with the actor where she's hugging them and putting them to bed and putting them in the, in the position of a child going through that experience of the last days with their mother. Um, and this just floored people in terms of um, a truly transformative experience. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about social VR. You're in an environment like this and this is what your world looks like inside the virtual reality headset this is what it looks like simultaneously. You're actually talking and feeling and touching other people while your avatars are what is touching and talking and feeling inside of those virtual spaces, but quite different. Um, again, the ways in which light field technologies are changing, our ability to walk into a picture, the way that you know augmented reality where we're bringing digital, uh, very high fidelity images and moving images into the real world such as this, um, you know, this is Magic Leap's teaser. Um, I've seen Magic Leap work and this isn't, is not quite there yet, but it's quite compelling. And this is an augmented reality headset that has been developed over the last six years or so. And then we get to artificial intelligence again, where artists are co-creating with algorithms, where nobody is the only creator. The artist isn't the creator. The, the smart system is working to co-create with them. And we have things like you know, this was one of our artists helped to create one of the first films that was written and um, the music, the props, the costumes, everything, the blocking of the film, every shot was created by an artificial intelligence who had been given um, a data set of many different sci-fi scripts with which they then wrote this script. And so they performed it. it. It was quite hilarious and still very gibberish because this is an early, 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 but now those um, smart systems that are replicating human creativity have gotten quite advanced. Um, we had a social AI, this is a deep machine learning artificial intelligence that was able to, um, this is, this is um, a neural network that learns, it's not just something that's analyzing data and kind of, but is, it is a learning machine. Um, and this social AI came to the Sundance Festival as really like a toddler speaking gibberish. And over the course of 10 days, it was interviewing all of our patrons, um, asking them these quite deep, um, emotional and provoking questions. And by the end of it, the AI was so advanced in its social um, ability to have a conversation, to interview, to, to, to relate to humans, that it actually directed in real time a live theater performance where uh, the dancer had, um, uh, earpiece in her ear where the AI was directing her choreographic movement. It was directing the projection to image. It was also directing the music by running um, Adreno drums. So the AI had control over the drum movement. And 
um, and, the, and, and the AI basically was designing the whole theater piece based on its analysis of interviewing the audience in real time in our emotional arcs. So it's so crazy. Um, I won't go into all the details, but we have artists that are playing with this human AI interface and trying to understand well, where does human live in this future of work scenario, which I know many of you have probably been engaged in this discourse. And so I can't go into all the details, but we have incredible artists that, are, that are, have um, been playing with that. This is one where the artist intervenes with the AI system in a smart home and tries to keep the element of humanity interfacing between the AI system that is serving the smart home uh, residents and the residents. This is that same artist where she fed a bunch of social media data to a guest list and then had a, a smart algorithmic system that she designed. She's a professor at UCLA and she designed the system where that she became the meat puppet of the AI where she had a piece in and the AI would tell her exactly what to do, exactly what to say, exactly who to introduce and also decided exactly what five people should be in the room for a party that would last 24 hours and each hour a five different people would come into the room. And so she was questioning can an AI um, system who has all this metadata about the people in the room can it do a better job of constructing a, a phenomenal, a great, a good social experience um, versus the kind of basic intuition of a person? So uh, obviously she's also playing with human beings um, losing um, energy and the, you know us needing to sleep and us having this kind of biological uh, cycle that the AI does not have to subscribe to. Um, and then where does this kind of rubber meet the road? Um, one of those things is, this is an old project now, but they have, the Shoah Foundation has created um, holographic graphic captured interviews, volumetric capture is the term, of Holocaust survivors. Um, and so there's a, and I've gotten a chance to meet particularly this, this uh, gentleman um, as a hologram and have a conversation with him because they interviewed him for a thousand questions, put the data in a database with a smart system um, that is analyzing your question through natural language processing and bringing up the exact kind of right answer that logically makes sense to respond to your question. And it's changing a lot of the relationship of like, what is the future of memoir? What is the future of documentary? What's the future of a family photo album when you can have a conversation with your ancestor um, rather than just have a static relationship of looking at a thick picture or looking at a video of them. Um, I won't go again, this is all advancing quite rapidly. This is a artificial intelligence uh, hologram that I met, uh, Magic Leap created, and she can like sit behind a desk, stand up, show me a picture. She pulled uh, something that was a just an object in a picture. She had me hold my hand up to it, and then she pulled it out of the frame, changed so that it became a blank frame. And this is all in real life with augmented reality, not virtual reality. So I was seeing the real world around me with these augmentations digitally. So, and then the 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 pipe that she pulled out of the picture was in my hand as a 3D object that I could hold. And so the the, ugh, the relationship of how this bleeds between realities are so crazy. Um, we have uh, people using crypto, like um, blockchain to hold truth. Um, this is a artist who's an indigenous um, maker, an AI coder and blockchain specialist. And she's trying to make sure we never lose our history again, like we have so many times on the, you know, Victor's history or the revisionist history that, particularly white supremacist history. Um, and there's so many ways in which robots and uh, kind of deep learning machine, artificial intelligence are in kind of um, intersected with culture. Um, this is uh, Chomsky came as a virtual, as a volumetric capture hologram and, and an AI of him came as well to the festival. And the AI version of him was generated from all the media that the MIT library had on Chomsky, which is one of the most you know, um, archived human being in digital history. And they were able to construct um, a personality and a holographic Chomsky to talk with a volumetrically captured Chomsky to see how faithful the AI was able to generate Chomsky's personality. Um, we've had artists that have gone to space and um, <laughs> and, and I, just so many things. Um, and then, you know, we're, now we're getting to the bio 
um, metric technologies and how that changes the canvas of things. This is an artist that um, has a biometric um, wearable technology on your body um, and based on your, your own body biometrics, can, can I change the conditions with which you experience this show? And the calmer you are, the more chaotic it becomes and the more chaotic you, be, you are internally, the more calm it becomes. Um, we, have, we showed in 2007, the first video game that you could play um, using just your thoughts without any controllers. Um, and now we even have cyborgs, um, legitimate people that have integrated in, um, technology into their bodies. This is a gentleman who's colorblind who use, uses this embedded technology to hear color. Um, we have artists that have embedded cameras in the back of their head and created films. We've, and then it gets into the DNA. This is an artist who went around New York City and collected DNA off the streets, very Gattaca. And she um, ran their uh, DNA profile in terms of ancestry and, and health. Um, but the thing that was really interesting is she also used the FBI th DNA profiling system to 3D print their faces um, based on you know, the ways in which we get profiled by our DNA. Um, and so she's really questioning the future of privacy um, and the ways in which we are able to use these emerging technologies to kind of break um, things, uh, barriers of knowledge that you know have a lot of ethical implications. Um, and then, last but not least, well, we we've now been able to really understand our physical bodies and biological um, environments as code, obviously with the mapping the human genome and so forth. But now scientists can actually and encode data onto our DNA molecules, replacing the A, T, and so forth with the zeros and ones. And so this is one of the first, you know, kind of moving images that we had in film um, that was, you know, in, encoded on a DNA molecule and then recalled. Um, but where it gets really interesting is just this January, Sundance showed a film. It's the first film that they showed that was extracted from DNA molecules. This was Lynn Hirschman Leeson's 40 years of a video log she's been keeping. All 40 years of videos are contained in this vial of DNA that's kept in um, this blue lit room. And so now DNA itself is storage for our information. It's part of our now communication system, not just epigenetically from biological processes that are natural and evolutionary, but now also from, some, from processes in which we can encode information on the DNA itself. And when I interviewed some of the people that are investing in this technology in Silicon Valley, you know, what should we be concerned about in terms of equality? They said, well, it's just long-term storage and it's very difficult to recall. So, you know, it's just think of it as, as deep storage. And then that very next summer, Caltech created the first DNA uh, artificial intelligence on DNA molecules. So it was a very simple AI that could read handwritten numbers, but yet we have created smart organic material um, without a sperm and an egg. And so this is so interesting. I mean, there's other examples of that in na nature, but the fact that a human being can create smart organic material that is um, not created from, from that kind of natural reproduction process. Even Bank of America asked, "Are we? Is there a twenty percent chance we're in the make matrix?" Uh, based on Nick Borstrom and and others, uh, kind of thinking of you know the ways in which our simulation, our our biological code is so. I mean, all all these things. I won't go into all the details. Very singularity. Um, but then going back to, we showed this film of a group of researchers who were working with paraplegics, and they were using the kind of head-mounted technology that can read brain activity. Um, and they and a virtual reality headset and exoskeleton uh, on their on on their legs and they were the paraplegic was able to say move my legs think move their my legs see their legs move in the virtual reality headset and the exoskeleton responded by moving their physical legs and after six months of this therapy they were able to hold their bowels and wiggle their toes and so these technologies like exoskeletons and virtual headsets and and the ways in which we can utilize just our our thought pattern. I mean, our, our the ways in which um, materials can track our brain activity in in being an input into technology. I mean, we're 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 having we can, there's a potential to have this fundamental impact on our physical bodies and our neurology. So that's why it's so exciting, but also something that has to be treaded with great thoughtful, prayerful care. Um, in terms of what we're doing, in terms of making our realities. So, what are the concerns? 
this is, I think, a great encapsulation of what I heard as the concern. And it's talking about racial justice, but I, I think that it also um, can be extract, extrapolated to all aspects of justice. The progress of our racial justice and the development of technologies are not linear. Every time you develop a new technology, you need to have a thought process, a history, and system of oppression that the technology is being created and released into. Think about the ways to bend the technology to justice and not allow it to replicate, entrench, and worsen injustice. I got a chance at Sundance in 2011, um, 2012, and beyond to be at the epicenter of some of these kind of crazy hype cycles around technology, particularly virtual reality. I was in the room when Palmer Luckey, who was a, you know, a young student um, in his late teens, um, had created a um, prototype, which now is known as the Oculus Rift, um, to bring Noni de la Pena's, a journalist's work on um, hunger in Los Angeles uh, as a document journalist work, bringing that to Sundance. They couldn't borrow the USC $50,000 headset, a uh, uh, virtual reality system and bring it to Park City, Utah. So he found a hack in using a cell phone, a smartphone. And that is the beginning. We had 12 hour waits for this piece. And a year later, a Kickstarter happened and $2 million were raised and then 75 million in VC was raised and then $2 billion um, uh, was, paid to Oculus um, by Facebook and Facebook bought Oculus. So within two years, I'm from 2012 to 2014, I get to go to the very first developers conference of the Oculus. Um, and it was a thousand people that got handpicked out of 150,000 people with the developer. And I walked into the ballroom of the Lowe's Hotel in Hollywood and only a woman I could see, and there was only one other person that I saw in the room. And I was shook. I was just like, oh, I have to, I'm, maybe I'll just go to Starbucks until my panel. Cause I just felt very much out of place um, as a woman of color in a, in a sea of mostly white men. And, um, and there was a narrative. At this plenary session, a woman, there was about 30 women I counted. I don't know how many were actually there, um, but I know the bathroom, the woman's bathroom was empty <laughs> and the men's was around the corner. Um, but I asked, there's a woman that stood up at the plenary session of all 1,000 people and said, what are we gonna do about the apparent gender gap? And she said it in a very sing-songy way. And the men on this stage, many of whom I know and respect and have had uh, you know, moments with in, in, this, in this incredible uh, emerging technology space, but they all said, this is a meritocracy. We cannot play identity politics. We need the best of the best and the best of the best are in this room. So basically, we don't have time to, to, to wait for women to catch up. And this was a sucker punch to the gut to all the women in the industry, especially since just a few months later, Sundance curated the first all virtual reality storytelling exhibition. Um, and it was 69% women, people of color, and people from the LGBT, LGBTQ community. So the meritocracy argument that the best of the best were white men, was completely not what we were seeing when we were doing a survey of thousands of people around the globe in terms of what the best of the best was. And we weren't looking to make it diverse. And Shari Freela was the chief curator. It just, the best of the best was diverse because there was a DIY community that was quite robust um, from a lot of different backgrounds. And so I went to MIT, I talked to Sepp Kamvar, who was the head of social media computing at that time. And he said, code is the new superpower. Code defines a social process and that social process defines our world. And so when he told me that I was, you know, and he talked about, you know, um, the ways in which Twitter started the food truck industry or how, you know, you know, gig economies were changing, the state was changing because of Airbnb, how, you know, green space might change because of Uber. And, and knowing who was in the room when I was at that Oculus Developers Conference and other technology spaces I'd been in, I, I said, so the superpower belongs with white men. Um, and that was a, a red flag for me. So then I went to Google and I hung out with um, the Google Creative Lab. Um, and I got a chance to speak with, um, you know, it, it was an incredible um, conversation around artists. And they were saying that artists were quite marginalized in the technology industry and that, um, and that artists were seen as a pair of hands. 
um, that weren't really at the table um, when it comes to making the real decisions around business and engineering. And so then and I was like, that was a red flag. So now not only people of color and women, but artists are all marginalized in the superpower um, of code. And then I got to go to Oxford to the Skull World Forum and I sat next to a man that ran the foresight work for one of the top tech companies in the world. And he showed me a video of the future and it was quite soulless and quite homogenous. Um, but he was a good guy with this really exciting spirit talking to a Sundance person around his film. And I said, you know, can I ask you, do you have anybody from the arts or the humanities working with you in this foresight center that basically leads the strategy? They build whole you know, offices and, and homes in the pipeline technology to get a sense of how the future will be and how to guide the direction of the company. And he looked at me and he said, you know, we ha only have engineers. And I said, how can you be imagining the future for the entire world through your technology company and not have anyone from the arts and the humanities informing what that future is? You know what, that's a blind spot. And when he said that, I thought about when I was in my master's program in business and we had to do a case study on the, um, the Columbia Space Shuttle and, um, and really NASA, one of NASA's great failures and trying to understand why did this tragedy happen? And it was ultimately determined that it was a cultural myopic um, hierarchical and uh, environment that did not allow diversity of thought. And when I thought about that and I saw what I was seeing within the technology industries, I was scared because this meant that we were using exponential technologies or designing for exponential technologies like artificial intelligence without the diversity of thought that could help us mitigate us hurtling into our own tragedies. But this isn't new. When you go back to the dawn of film as an emerging tech, media technology, this was the very first feature film. That was a KKK propaganda film that was positioning black men as the boogeyman and part of a particular narrative post-Civil War, part of post-Reconstruction to try to dis display the progress of things like black street and black, um, economic and social advancement. And this was the film that we started this emerging technology with. Still to this day, children cannot identify positive qualities with the black doll. Still to this day, black men are seen through the lens of the boogeyman. And um, whether we're conscious or unconscious about it, we fear because we've had those narratives embedded in this history of film media. And still to this day, less than 20% of Americans can identify positive words with black faces. This is all part of that process. Now we're entering the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence. Go back. So a previous industrial revolution, this is what we did. We marginalized and we're still on the level of genocide with a community in this country, in the United States of America, that may have brought to the table the firewalls that could have mitigated the hurtling into tragedy that was happening at this industrial revolution towards climate change. One of our artists and indigenous rights activists, Heather Ray says, it's been a 400 year run of genocide and slavery that built the foundation for industrialization industrialization moving through all the natural resources, and we just got the bill, which is climate change. So when I think about the film industry and the pitfalls we fell into with myopic and, and uh, limited inclusion, when I think about the industrial revolution and the limitations and hurdles into our own tragedies because of limited inclusion, and then I think about, this is the question I ask, what are your concerns? And bias narratives, bias algorithms, and false democratization of media, um, patronizing attitudes, I won't even spend time on this, but just some incredibly patronizing attitudes within the power elite of Silicon Valley. Um, power consolidation, um, thing that is a surplus technology, but it's only being managed by the few, like artificial intelligence, and that's the CEO of Microsoft saying that. Um, consolidated, only four companies having all social media, um, you know, representation participation gaps. I mean, one of the most robust diversity um, statistics on Silicon Valley came out in 2018. And not only do you see obviously black Latino, but even Asians behind white in terms of all genders. But when you look at the genders, you know, same thing, black women, Latino, Asians, but look at the Asian men. We often have this vision of the model minority where at least Asian men are getting through 
but look at the bamboo seal that they discovered in this data, that Asian men are actually not in the positions of power that we assume when we look at, you know, the images of, of tech, tech and computer science um, participants. So let's talk about this image and the innovator stereotype. NPR did an investigative journalism piece on why women particularly dropped out of technology in 83, 84, just psh, fell. Um, in the other fields like med medicine, law and phys physical sciences, we were kind of coming out of the feminist revolution in the 60s and 70s and, and, and almost at parity with men. But at 84, 85, we just, 83, 84, we just dropped out of technology. And when they went back and looked at it, it was because the stories that were being told by major tech companies in advertising and the stories that Hollywood was telling in films, Weird Science, Revenge of the Nerds, um, uh, War Games, that white men were the center of these stories. And so what happened is women started to adopt the inferiority complex or started to allow their inferiority complex to take root. They, they was all these, uh, and so they started um, saying, I don't think I'm smart enough. And uh, even though they were getting same grades or better as their male counterparts, simultaneously the men were hazing the women. And so it triggered, these, these myopic narratives actually triggered both the worst of both, both gender the you know kind of toxic masculinity and the uh, inferiority complex we've lost you know 40 years of, of the participation of women in helping us to shape and meaning make within technology because of these stories that were happening over a very short period of time and but have continued um so just there's so many different ways in which you know this research you'll see that, that all these concerns that were mostly keep coming back around to these same issues of inequity um, and then I just wanted to kind of get to, I know I'm, I'm out of time, so thank you Shabnam and everybody for letting me talk so much. Um, but there was this idea, uh, one of the interviews I had with someone who uh, was at Google Diversity, now at Walt Disney's Diversity, and she talked about, we have an inability to imagine our future and it's killing us. Um, and she talked about the fact that when you don't have a sense, and especially a shared sense of the future and where you're going, that is equitable, that you actually retreat to what you know, and you also kind of lose a sense of empathy, and, you, and there's this, this sense of agency that disappears, and it starts to implode on each other, and I think we're seeing that in our culture, in you know, ideological wars now. So I'm walking through Oxford, you know, at this world forum, and I was just so distraught, and I was talking to a friend of mine, a colleague from Sundance, and I was like, what, I mean, it's just happening all over again you know, and it's happening all over again, right before my eyes, and I feel powerless. And she said, you know, Kamal, it hasn't happened yet. There is an opportunity for intervention. And she reminded me of people like Jane Jacobs, who at the time of this rapid innovation cycle in, in real estate development in New York City in the mid century, 20th century, she stood up and said, no, we need spaces for green space. She stood up and said, no, we want places for well-being and community, regardless if it's less efficient for our freeways and our transportation of products. Um, I thought about, and so I asked people, what are the interventions that are not necessarily a, an economic you know, downside, but actually could be part of a boon to shared prosperity and actually growing the pie. And so, you know, I, I, I invite you to kind of look go onto the makingreality.org website and look at the, the interventions around mitigating bias, like universal basic, like universal design practices, um, things like, you know, how are we mitigating group think and having disciplines intersect in their ways in which they're interpreting and making meaning around the advancements in science and technology with the partnership of artists and humanities and philosophies, like Bell Labs has tried to do both in the past and is doing now with the EAT program you know, how, what are the interventions for policy and infrastructure? One little quick example on that is I interviewed someone at Ford who said it was in the halls of Ford in, when television was an emerging medium that they decided to make an intervention and fund public television in this country. And we got PBS and it was phenomenal. We're very thankful that we got that, but it was so minuscule compared to the vision of public television and public media that, they, they think about what if we were 25 years earlier in our intervention? And so I, they asked me, how can we be, you know, not lose kind of that much on-ramping time to intervene within emerging media so that we don't 
so that we do not um, completely get it sucked up by capitalistic imperatives and that we do create space for the commons, place for the public, place for knowledge for and, and, and knowledge generation. And so they talked about in the 90s, they were fighting for just access to the internet. We're still having that fight, even though the UN has made it a, a human right. And now we're in a stalemate with large um, monopoly type tech organizations around addictive design tactics and the ways in which their filter bubbles and bias algorithms are um, really changing the way in which we understand truth and have access to information. Um, but while we're still in those embattled states, we already have billions of dollars being invested in smart cities, smart homes, completely wired in omni data sphere environments. What are the interventions? Who's thinking about the public space and the commons and the value to the, to the whole and well-being in this design? Is that being designed in, or is it just pure capitalistic imperatives, stakeholder value, not stakeholder value, but shareholder value only? And even while this Web 3.0 is already coming to market, we are on the brink of bringing things to market that are what they call Web 4.0, which is um, where basically you have to have an artificial intelligence intervene between you and the data sphere, you and the technology world, because human beings cannot will not be able to keep up with the amount of information that we need to synthesize on a daily basis. I can't even keep up with my emails today. Um, and so that web 4.0 kind of infrastructure is already in process. And are we thinking about what does this mean for well-being, for unity, for diversity, for justice and equity? So all that to say, there's plenty of ideas about what are the frameworks for action, but I think at the root of it, we're looking at how do we have a collective and equitable imagination of our future so that we do not design into our perceptual limitations. So we do not leave critical information and knowledge off the table like we've done in previous innovation cycles. And so that diversity and inclusion will actually lead us to the best of what is possible with these technologies that have been released to humankind versus kind of worst possible scenarios of even further ex creating extremes of wealth and poverty and um, justice. With that, I know I'm over time, so I'm gonna stop and thank you so much for giving me this time with you today. Thank you so much, Kamal. I think you were right when you said this is one presentation we'll have to go back to and listen to each <laughs> component and process because you have given us so much to think about and such insight into the future of technology, but also the intersection of the arts, uh, technology, media, and of course our values. Um, one of the concepts that I think we'll be thinking about after this presentation is this idea of democratizing the imagination of the future and whose story and whose narrative uh, is at the forefront of these conversations, um, which is such an important concept for us to consider. And um, of course, that also reminds me of uh, a quotation from the Universal House of Justice that the Association for Baha'i Studies has often used to ground its work, which is that access to knowledge is the right of every human being and participation in its generation, application and diffusion, a responsibility that all must shoulder in the great enterprise of building a prosperous world civilization. Each individual according to his or her talents and abilities, justice demands universal participation and I think your presentation has so beautifully shown us that um, truly uh, there is a long road perhaps to universal participation, but that is what is required uh, to materialize, to bring to life that um, society and vision by Baha'u'llah. So thank you very much again to our uh, speaker, Kamal Sinclair. And thank you to all who have joined us for this presentation. We look forward to seeing you this week in our next series of uh, presentations and opportunities to engage with each other and learn from each other. Thank you again. <laughs>